Hi everyone. This mini lecture is going to be about AC effects in the Druda model. So today we'll call we'll talk about AC conductivity and plasma oscillations. But before we dive into this, let's review some of the basic assumptions about the Druda model. Remember, first, the Druda model assumes that electrons are classical objects. The Druda model thinks about electrons and metals as just charged particles in a classical gas. All right, so that's the first assumption. The next basic assumption of the Druda model is that electrons collide with the ions with a characteristic time scale. Okay, characteristic time scale is tau, and uh, it's variously called the relaxation time or the collision time in the Druda model. We also assume in the Druda model that the electrons are free. This means that they don't interact with the ions except during collisions. We also assume that the electrons are independent. This means they don't interact with each other at all. And finally, we assume that the electrons reach thermal equilibrium via this process of collisions. Now, it's a really good idea for you to remember these assumptions and file them away in your mind. In some sense, this list of assumptions will serve as an outline for the course. After we finish talking about the Druda model, we're essentially going to start relaxing these assumptions one by one, and we'll see what new effects emerge when, for example, we allow electrons to be quantum mechanical, or we allow them to interact with each other, or the ions um, in more substantial ways than the Druda model allows, okay? Last time, we also derived the equation of motion in the Druda model. So we derived this equation of motion. It describes how the momentum P of the electrons changes in time in response to an external force. Okay, and last time we considered external forces including electric and magnetic fields. We also derived Ohm's law in the framework of the Druda model. Remember that we wrote it down as J equals sigma E. J is the current density, E is the electric field, and sigma is the conductivity and it equals NE squared tau divided by M. Remember Little n is the density of electrons and material. Again, tau is the relaxation time. Okay, uh, we also talked about the Hall effect. And we derived the magneto resistance rho as a function of the magnetic field H. It's the ratio of the longitudinal electric field and current. It's equal to one over sigma naught. Sigma naught is the bare Druda conductivity. Sometimes I'll use sigma naught or just plain sigma to mean NE squared tau over M. Uh, if you're confused, just ask. We also derived the Hall coefficient, which is the transverse electric field divided by the longitudinal current times the magnetic field H. It is a constant minus one over NAC. Okay, the Hall effect is really one of the triumphs of the Druda model. And as I said before, it's something that's still used commonly today in uh, experimental research. So today we'll talk about AC conductivity in the Druda model and plasma oscillations. 
So let's start with AC conductivity. So we'll go back to our equation of motion and let's assume that we have a time varying electric field and let's assume that it's a harmonic electric field so that I can write it as the real part of some complex exponential like this. So I'm gonna play fast and loose with my notation here. So I'll use E of T to mean the actual time varying electric field. And I'm gonna use E of omega to indicate the Fourier component of E of T at frequency omega. So I hope it's clear to you. Um, let me just spell this out. explicitly. Um, so with this assumption, now let's look for solutions to our equation of motion. Which is this. And moreover, let's assume that the solutions to this differential equation are also harmonic. At the same frequency as the driving field. So again, here I'm using P of t to indicate the time dependent momentum of the electrons and p of omega is the Fourier component of that momentum at frequency omega. All right, so what we're going to do is to substitute this expression for the momentum into our uh, equation of, of, uh, of motion, both here and here. And we're gonna substitute our expression for the electric field in here. So here we go. Let me just write down the equation of motion again so you can see where we're going. Okay, so let's substitute in our expressions for both P and E. So I've divided this last equation through by e to the minus i omega t on both sides. Um, again, it shouldn't be surprising for you to hear this, but uh, effectively what we've done is to take a Fourier transform of this differential equation. Um, another thing we can do is recall that uh, the current density is minus n e V, J is minus N E V. That's something we showed last time. We can take the Fourier transform of this equation. Again, uh, let me explicitly include the time dependences here. Let me take the Fourier transform of J and V in the same way uh, that I did for P and E. I'll get J of omega is minus N E V of omega. This is minus N E P over M. All right, uh, let's use this equation up here and solve for P. It's not so hard to see that P is minus E times E over one over tau minus I omega. Now we're gonna substitute this expression for P in here. And what do we have? J of omega is equal to minus n e squared tau over m times e over one minus i omega tau. 
let me write it as sigma naught over one minus i omega t times e of omega. Again, I'm playing fast and loose with notation here. I'm sort of suppressing frequencies and times. I hope it's clear. Um, you can see that in the AC case now, the current density J is still linearly proportional to the electric field, uh, but the conductivity has a slightly modified form. So we're going to say that the AC conductivity sigma of omega is equal to sigma naught, which again is an E squared tau over M, the bare or DC conductivity in the Druda model, divided by one minus I omega tau. And you can easily see that at zero frequency, the AC conductivity is exactly equal to, uh, to the DC conductivity as it should be. All right, so this is how we think about uh, AC currents in response to AC electric fields in the Druda model. Uh, let's now move on to applying this to the propagation of waves in metals. Uh, let me also add that um, AC conductivities like this are also often used still today in, in modern experimental physics. So uh, the expression of an AC conductivity in this way is another of the successes of the Druda model. So let's now talk about the propagation of EM waves, electromagnetic waves in metals. Again, this is in the framework of the Druda model. So let's recall Maxwell's equations. These are the divergence of E vanishes, so we're assuming uh, no, no charge density here. Curl of E is minus one over C dH dt. The divergence of H is zero, and the curl of H is four pi over Cj plus one over C dE dt. All right, so let's look for solutions to these equations. That have harmonically varying electric and magnetic fields. Let's also dive in, or, or let's also, before we dive in, remember some handy vector identities, which is the curl of the curl of some function E is equal to the gradient of the divergence of E minus L squared E. Okay, so what we're going to do first uh, is apply uh, another curl to this equation here. And we're going to use this vector identity, noting of course that this term vanishes. So minus del squared E is equal to minus one over C times the curl of dH dt. Here's the extra curl. Uh, that we already simplified out on the left-hand side. Um, let's substitute the other Maxwell's, the other Maxwell's equations that specifies what the curl of H is. Uh, so here we go. So this is, uh, let me get my eraser here. like this. So um, I, I, in writing this equation, uh, assumed 
again, this form of H. So uh, this factor of I omega here came from the time derivative that I uh, took of H of T. And then once I took that time derivative, then I computed the curl of H here, uh, which from uh, another of Maxwell's equations is four pi over CJ plus one over C D E D T. Um, so, so far we have just been massaging Maxwell's equations here. Now let's bring in the Druda model and we're gonna substitute our expression for J that we already derived in the Druda model. We're gonna substitute in sigma E. Here's the Druda AC conductivity. This factor of I omega here came because I assumed that the time varying electric field had a similar form uh, to this over here. So this step here is where the Druda model comes in. Let's now simplify this result. Okay, so you can see I brought uh, a factor of minus i omega out from inside the parentheses, uh, and in doing so, I've arrived at this last equation here. Um, this, though, looks like a wave equation, right? On the left-hand side, we have uh, the the uh, the second derivative of this vector field e. On uh, the right-hand side, we have uh, the vector field e itself. Um, we have the frequency and wave speed over here. Uh, so this looks like uh, a wave equation for an EM wave. Which we expect to look something like this. So the wave equation for an electric field, the wave equation for the electric field of a wave propagating in a medium uh, looks like this here, minus del squared B is omega squared over C squared times epsilon of omega, the complex dielectric constant of the material times uh, the wave itself. So we can read off now what we expect the complex dielectric constant of this Drudel model for a classical gas of electrons to be. And it's exactly this term in parentheses here. So we say that in the Drudel model, the complex dielectric constant of a metal is one plus four pi i times the AC conductivity over the frequency omega. So by considering what happens to electric, electromagnetic waves in a metal, we've derived the form of the complex dielectric constant of that metal within the framework of the Druda model. So we can make some further headway by supposing that omega tau is much, much larger than one. Uh, this means that the, the frequency of the driving field is uh, vastly larger than, um, than the characteristic uh, collision time. If you like, it's vastly larger than the characteristic rate of collisions of the electrons in this metal. So remember that the AC conductivity in the Doodle model is the DC conductivity divided by one minus I omega tau. Now in the limit where omega tau is much, much larger than one, this is sigma naught over omega tau with the i upstairs now. So we can substitute in the form for the, the DC conductivity. This is n e squared tau over m. Okay, you see that the tau's cancel, so we're left with i n e squared over m omega. So if we now use this form of the AC conductivity and 
substitute it into our expression for the complex dielectric constant, we get epsilon of omega is one minus four pi n squared over m omega squared. I can write this as one minus omega p squared over omega squared, provided that omega p is the square root of four pi and e squared over m. Now, omega p is called the plasma frequency. We'll see why in just a second here. Maybe one thing to note is that when omega is greater than omega p, when the driving frequency is greater than the plasma frequency, uh, epsilon of omega, which is one minus omega p squared over omega squared is greater than zero. Uh, that means that we have a real uh, uh, dielectric constant, a real, a, real, uh, a real propagation constant for the wave. The dielectric constant is positive. The index of refraction is, is uh, 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 real. And in this case, the wave can propagate. in the metal and it is transparent. Conversely, when the driving frequency is less than the plasma frequency, the dielectric constant is negative, the index of refraction is imaginary, and that means that the wave is uh, strongly attenuated and it doesn't propagate through the metal. So in real metals, typical values of the plasma frequency are in the order of 10 to the 18 hertz uh, with wavelengths of order 10 to the minus seven meters, which is 10 to the minus five centimeters. So uh, shorter than visible light. So that's the AC conductivity and complex dielectric constant of a metal within the framework of the Druda model. Let's now talk about plasma oscillations. So, so far we've just talked about the possibility that an electromagnetic wave can propagate through a metal. And we saw that if the frequency of that wave is larger than the plasma frequency, indeed the wave can propagate. Uh, let's ask a different but related question, which is can the metal, can the classical electron gas support density oscillations? So now we're going to allow that the density of electrons in uh, the density of charge in the metal is uh, no longer zero, but uh, will allow for the fact that it can oscillate in time. So the first thing we need to do is recall the continuity equation. So this is the divergence of the current density is equal to minus d rho dt. Here rho is the charge density of the material. If, again, we assume that current densities, fields, momenta, et cetera, are harmonically varying in time, it makes sense for us to assume that the charge density rho also has this similar form. So let's return to Maxwell's equations. 
Gauss's law, which specifies the divergence of E. I'm going to write this explicitly in the frequency domain, uh, is equal to 4 pi times rho. All right. Um, let me now substitute in our expression for j. This is where the Druda model comes in here. So I'm going to substitute in uh, for e j over sigma. So the divergence of now j uh, is equal to 4 pi sigma times rho. Okay, so this is, this is a result of Gauss's law here together with the Druda model. The continuity equation also specifies what the divergence of j is. Uh, so um, we know that the divergence of j based on Gauss's law is 4 pi times rho, but based on continuity, the divergence of j should be minus d rho dt. Well, minus d rho dt is nothing more than i omega rho of omega. So we must have that i omega rho of omega is equal to 4 pi sigma times rho itself. So this is now uh, the continuity equation plus Gauss's law plus the Druda model. Um, so what does this tell us? Well, 4 pi times sigma of omega must be equal to i omega. So I've just canceled the rows from both sides. This means that 1 plus 4 pi i sigma of omega over omega is equal to zero. Okay. This should remind you of something. Remember that our expression for the complex dielectric constant of metal in the framework of the Druda model is one plus four pi i sigma of omega divided by omega. And we just said that uh, the plasma frequency is the frequency at which the dielectric constant is zero. For driving frequencies omega above the plasma frequency, the dielectric constant is positive. For driving frequencies omega below the plasma frequency, the dielectric constant is negative. So the plasma frequency omega p is the frequency at which the dielectric constant vanishes. But you see, that's exactly the frequency that will solve this equation here. So this equation has a solution when the driving frequency is equal to omega p, the plasma frequency. So the frequency of density oscillations that a metal can support occur at the plasma frequency. So this type of oscillation is a plasma oscillation or plasmon. Okay, so it's a charge uh, density wave. Um, we arrived at this understanding by considering Maxwell's equations, the Druda model, and the equation of continuity. Uh, there's an even simpler model you can use uh, to understand what's going on. So let's talk about that now. So let's suppose we have a chunk of metal. Here it is. And let's suppose we grab a hold of all of the electrons in the middle and we pull them over just a little bit to the right. So we'll leave the ions where they are, but we're going to pull the electrons just a little bit over to the right. So let's imagine doing that. So here is kind of an imaginary box of electrons, which I pulled over to the right. Let's suppose I've pulled the electrons over a distance d and just outside the metal 
on the right-hand side, because I pulled the electrons over, there will be an excess of negative charge. And on the left edge of the metal, there will be a little region of positive charge. Again, ordinarily in equilibrium, the electrons are sitting on top of the ions. The charge density is zero. But if I pull the electrons over to the right, I get a little surplus of electrons on the right side and a surplus of ions on the left side. All right. So I have effectively two, uh, two surface charge densities, one on the left and one on the one on the right. The one on the left has magnitude plus n e d. So n is the, the volume density of the electrons. D is the distance I've pulled the electrons over. And on the right side, the charge density is minus n e d. So this now looks like a parallel plate capacitor. There's an electric field that's built up on the inside of this metal. The electric field in this parallel plate capacitor is just 2 pi sigma plus 2 pi uh, sigma. Uh, so by, by sigma, uh, I mean like this. So let's call this sigma is equal to plus NED. And so let's say that sigma L is plus NED is equal to plus sigma. Sigma R is minus N equal minus NED, which is minus sigma. So the total electric field is, is four pi sigma. Now let's ask, what is the equation of uh, motion of the, the electron gas, right? I've, I've uh, pulled the electrons apart from the, their, from the ions. There's an electric field that wants to oppose this motion. When I let the electrons go, they want to snap back. And maybe it's not so hard to imagine that some kind of oscillation will occur. So uh, the equation of motion of the, the electron gas is the following. So let me write it as nmd double dot. So this will be the mass times the acceleration of, uh, of, of all of the electrons in the system. Um, this is equal to minus capital N E E times the electric field that's built up. So this is a, a statement of Newton's second law for all of the electrons in, uh, in this piece of metal. All right, so this is minus N E four pi sigma. Again, sigma is a, the surface charge density associated with this parallel plate capacitor. This is minus uh, n e 4 pi n d e. That came from here. So this is equal to minus 4 pi n e squared times n d. So now, if you like, uh, I can divide through by capital N, which is the total number of electrons on both sides. You see that D double dot, the second time derivative of D is proportional to D. That should tell you that uh, a sinusoidal function will solve this equation. You can straight away read off that the frequency of oscillations will be four pi N E squared over M. This is exactly the plasma frequency that we wrote down before. So uh, this is the cartoon picture of a plasma oscillation and why it should occur at uh, the plasma frequency that we've now derived in several different ways. So that's the end of this mini lecture on AC effects in the Druda model. Uh, the next mini lecture will focus on thermal conductivity and other thermal effects in the Druda model.